regular admitting thank you. You have these angelic voices.
Hi, Paolo. How are you? we're going to start we're going to live stream at four o'clock exactly that's when we'll turn off well they turn off the music just so it's good to see all the names in the participants list they are just names i used to see in the conference program but now you're here in the zoom room welcome everybody paula welcome are you ready yes yes good jonathan will speak dr christina brito will also speak Welcome, ma'am. Welcome, Jonathan. One more minute. <laughs> okay, so I, hello. <laughs> and Dr. Quatemoc William Moore, hello also, saw your chat. Who else? Hello, Dr. Ruth Deliope. Okay, so 3.59, we're almost there. We're about to begin. Um, stand by people uh, who will be live streaming on YouTube as well as on Facebook. At four o'clock, when we change the slide, that's when we will start. Oh, it's four o'clock. Okay, Noel, is this our slide? This is Contacts and Continuities, 500 Years of Asian-Iberian Encounters, an international conference online hosted by Ateneo de Manila University. It is now 4 p.m. local time. Good afternoon from Manila. We are live streaming on YouTube through the conference channel and on Facebook through the National Quincentennial Committee Facebook page. I am Nikki Carsey Cruz from the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies of the School of Humanities, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon's opening ceremony and keynote speech. Greetings to all our participants from all over in the Zoom room and on social media. We now begin the program with the Philippine National Anthem. Sa 
To officially open the conference, let us listen to the welcome address from Father Roberto Yap of the Society of Jesus, President of Ateneo de Manila University. On behalf of the Ateneo de Manila University, I welcome you to the online international conference, Contacts and Continuities, 500 Years of Asian-Iberian Relations. Bringing together more than 70 eminent scholars and artists from around the world, covering four broad topic areas and taking place over four weeks, it is one of the largest and most comprehensive conferences about Asian-Iberian relations and a fitting commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the Magellan Expedition's landing in 1521 in what would become the Philippine Islands. The Ateneo de Manila University is privileged to collaborate with the Centro de Humanidades of the Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, Portugal, and the Queen Centennial Committee of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines in bringing you this seminal conference. As a Philippine university founded by Spanish Jesuits, we are keenly aware of the influence and impact of Ferdinand Magellan's feet and the opening of our country and region to the culture of Spain and Portugal, as well as other European nations. As a country at the crossroads of East and West, whose culture and national identity is as much Spanish and American as it is Asian, the Philippines acknowledges and celebrates its diverse and manifold heritage. It seems quite appropriate then that the conference exploring the historical encounters between our continents and the consequent transformation of our countries is hosted by a university which is a product of these encounters. In a world that is connected by instantaneous communication, where vast quantities of information are available at one's fingertips, where travel to the outside hemisphere is possible within a day, the lack of knowledge, understanding, and appreciation of other cultures is almost inconceivable. Yet, it is a hard truth of life in our supposedly enlightened and globally interconnected world. It is our shared hope that by openly discussing the legacies of the past encounters and continuing relations between Asia and Europe during this conference, we gain not only a clearer perspective of our histories, but provide opportunities for establishing stronger foundations for future encounters. My warmest greetings to everyone, and I wish you all an insightful, an enjoyable conference. Thank you very much, Father Bobby, for your welcome address. We now have opening remarks from the host organization and partner institutions who collaborated on this conference series. We start with a message from the main organizer and host, Dr. Jonathan Chua, Dean of the School of Humanities of Ateneo de Manila University. Good afternoon to our listeners uh, in Asia. Uh, good morning to our listeners in Iberia. I'm happy that you're tuned in. Um, since the, uh, the focus of this conference series is the effects of encounters, uh, which in many cases exceed expectations, uh, I think it, it will make sense for me to say something about the origin uh, of, this, of this conference. Uh, this conference would not have been possible without chance encounters. 
uh, of the decent kind. Uh, I had originally wanted back in 2018 uh, during a school-wide planning, a very modest affair of uh, a few lectures on Hispanic influences uh, in Philippine art and literature. It would be a way I thought then of uh, uh, getting together the different academic units of the School of Humanities and with the Department of History of the School of Social Sciences uh, with the quincentenary as an excuse. Uh, but then came Dr. Noel Rodriguez, whom I had not been in contact with for several years. And she introduced me to uh, Paulo Pinto, uh, who happened to be uh, visiting the Philippines at that time. Uh, he gave a talk, I think, on Portuguese language. Uh, and who had met Dr. Stephanie Ku, whose office I was originally tapping for funding uh, for this event. And she had happened to speak at a conference organized by CHAM in 2017, of which this conference, Contacts and Continuities, is now the continuation. Uh, there were many other dots uh, that connected, no? Uh, that have led us to today, to this conference series. Um, there are some 70 speakers from different time zones, arranged into over 20 panels spread across a month's time, speaking on various topics, uh, much broader than I had intended uh, at first, to audiences uh, in different parts of the world. To me, that in itself is an illustration of the theme of the conference, no? contacts and continuities and connecting dots. No? Uh, in this time of uh, continuing uncertainty, uh, it may be consoling to think that out of these random uh, encounters, random occurrences, um, something meaningful uh, may yet emerge. No? Uh, the School of Humanities uh, of the Ateneo de Manila University uh, in, with the cooperation of JAM and the NHCP uh, is happy you know, to be hosting this conference. Uh, I hope that it leads to more fruitful uh, encounters in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chua. This international conference, as he mentioned, is a collaborative effort with partner institutions from the other side of the world. May I invite Dr. Cristina Brito, Director of CHAM, Centro de Humanidades, Universidad Nova de Lisboa, for her opening remarks. Dr. Brito. Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, olá a todos e todas. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hello everyone. It is really my pleasure to be here today as the head of CHAM, the Center uh, for the Humanities of Nova FCSH, uh, Faculdade de Ciências Sociais e Humanas, here in Lisbon, uh, where I stand today. Uh, I start by acknowledging and greeting the presence of the representatives of several institutions and entities that are here today with us. Thank you so much for inviting me here. It is truly a pleasure to be here today and the days to come. I would, love, I would also like to thank the, the host of the conference, uh, all the commissions involved in the organization and the scientific panels, um, all my colleagues, uh, everyone that, that were able to put together such a large and relevant event as we have here today. And of course, also to acknowledge the presence of the audience, I'm assuming a large, worldwide audience for attending the conference today and the days to come. And also um, to greet my colleagues from CHAM, uh, from, from Nova FCSH, as well as colleagues from other institutions and other countries. It's very good to be here all together, even if not in person, but at a distance, we are still together. So CHAM, the Center of, uh, for the Humanities, is an inter-university un and interdisciplinary research unit. And we gather more than 200 researchers studying different geographies, chronologies, and with the backbone of several disciplines, ranging from archaeology, history of art, heritage, literature, philosophy to history, uh, economic, social, uh, religious, political, and environmental history. Today, we conduct state-of-the-art investigation, and we work in an integrative uh, and global approach as much as possible, as much as we can, also with cross-cultural and plural views in the work that we do and in our daily uh, basis work. What we aim at CHAM is uh, seeing the world and understanding this common world of ours through the humanities lens. 
how we have been in the past and how are we today. Within SHAM, we have uh, nine uh, different research groups and seven thematic lines of research. Um, and currently our scientific project revolves uh, generally around the topic, the concept of, of frontiers. So this is also a, a topic that is quite relevant to the event that we are here, here today. One of these thematic lines uh, is called Asia, Peoples, Powers and Interactions. And it is coordinated by our, our colleague uh, researcher at CHAM, Paul Pinto, that will be uh, addressing the keynote following, to whom I extend my, my thank you for being part of this large event and all uh, the projects and networking that led to it. And I think that this conference really sets the tone for, for the research that we have been doing at CHAM uh, in connection with many other parts of the world, um, giving voice to several cultural realities over the time, of course, uh, their contact, their interactions, um, their conversations, their conference, but also allow us uh, at the same time today to be in touch with one another, uh, to be part of each other's lives and to understand one another uh, more closely. So these contacts and continuities, so in, in this case, in the 500 years of the Asian Iberian encounters, is really a very important, very uh, relevant and very up-to-date topic. Um, the conference itself, it's part of a, large re a larger research and networking project that involves SHAM here at Nova FCSH, but also the Philippines Embassy in Portugal, the National Quintessential Commission, and of course the Ateneo uh, de Manila University. There is also a protocol that we have signed a couple of years ago between our uni university and Ateneo de Manila University that uh, allow us to study together the relationships between Portugal and the Philippines. This is a project also coordinated by Paul Pinto and allow us to put together to write narratives uh, of connected histories. Again, very relevant for today and, and for we, we, who we were in the past. So I just want to say once more, I'm very proud to be here today. So this is the second uh, scientific encounter of the, there, there was another one a couple of years ago held here in Lisbon, 2019, I think, held in the Portuguese National Library. And I sincerely hope that there are more to come, more events, more conferences, more research, more outputs that come out of this uh, joint collaboration. We are here uh, to work with you, very pleased to be here and to welcome you once more in Lisbon, if, if that's the case. So I just want to, to thank you once more and I hope that we can meet sometime soon in person in Lisbon, uh, in the Philippines or any, anywhere else in the world. Thank you so much and have a very good conference. Thank you very much, Dr. Brito. Our conference is part of a wider quincentennial commemoration in the Philippines. Let us listen to a message from Dr. René Escalante, Director of the National Historical Commission. On behalf of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and the National Quincentennial Committee, allow me to express my sincerest appreciation to the School of Humanities at Ateneo de Manila University and the Universidad de Nova de Lisboa for organizing this gathering of local and international scholars. Thank you as well for offering this endeavor to the 2021 Quincentennial Commemorations in the Philippines. Aside from the Quincentennial Commemorations, this 2021, the Filipino people will also commemorate the birth centenary of eminent Philippine historian William Henry Scott. He is an American by birth, but Filipino at heart. At the name of the Manila University Press, post you mostly published his famous work, Barangay, in 1996. That alone, I can say, is Ateneo's greatest contribution in popularizing Scott's advocacy to elevate the discourse on Philippine pre-Hispanic history, which includes the events in 1521 in the Philippines. The book is also the baseline of the National Quincentennial Committee in elevating Filipinos' awareness of their pre-colonial history textually and visually. 
through that Ateneo book, a number of Filipinos in the past 25 years were educated about how to reconstruct Philippine colonial history through available historical sources, especially the Portuguese archival materials. Before, a lot of Filipinos thought that Philippine history began only after the arrival of Magellan in 1521. Archaeologists, ethnographers, linguists, and anthropologists scientifically prove that this is wrong. The Philippines already had a flowering civilization thousands of years before the arrival of Magellan. You may ask, where are the historians in proving that there was history before 1521? For a long time, history before the Spanish colonization was the domain of the aforesaid professionals. But the likes of Scott asserted the place of a historian in writing the period through the available written sources. Aside from his barangay, you will appreciate Scott even more through his equally significant yet unknown article in Ateneo de Manila's Philippine Studies Journal entitled The Mediterranean Connection, which was published in 1989. In that article, Scott proved that there was a rich Philippine pre-colonial history before 1521, if only we diligently expand the domain of the historians from the Hispanic period. He gave ample emphasis on the value of Portuguese accounts before 1521. Takes example the works of Tome Pires and Joao de Barros, who recorded that our ancestors from Luzon were already trading in Malacca and Singapore. They even participated in the Armada of the Ottoman Empire in retaking Malacca from the Portuguese and in the Muslim campaigns of the Sultanate of Aceh against the Binangabaos of Sumatra years before the arrival of Magellan in the Philippines. The National Incentennial Committee and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines have been championing the kind of incentennial commemorations that is not Magellanic-centric but event-centric. Focusing just on Magellan will complicate things as the Filipinos have been battered with centuries of cultural timidity due to Eurocentric narrative. But we cannot discount the fact that Magellan's vision to discover a route beyond the Americas contributed to the destiny and destination of humankind in the last 500 years, especially the, the Filipino people. But the Filipinos will assert our ancestors did influence the result and outcome of the first circumnavigation of the world, like how our ancestors saved Magellan and his crew from starvation, undernourishment, and dehydration when they were in summer in March 1521. They also showed them how to fight for dignity and sovereignty when Magellan interfered in the social and political life that resulted from the Battle of Mactan in April 1521. The National Incentennial Committee and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines decided to join the global commemoration of the first circumnavigation of the world to raise the awareness that our ancestors were not savages like how Western writers and artists depicted them in books and artworks. A case in point is the 1921 stained glass of the Geographic Society of Lisbon in which our ancestors are drawn like Ethiopians. In fact, as part of the centennial commemorations in the Philippines, 2021 has been declared by the Philippine government as the year of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors. I hope that the papers to be read in this conference will be published soon. May the ongoing network of Portuguese and Filipino historians and scholars prosper in the coming years. Our engagement with Portugal shall be beneficial to us historically and culturally. Hopefully, the Philippines will also contribute to Portugal in whatever means we can. Thank you.
and congratulations to all. Thank you very much, Dr. Rene Escalante. Today's opening ceremony is also an occasion for the opening keynote for the entire four-part conference series. And it has fallen upon me to introduce our keynote speaker. On your screen, you can see his name, his picture, his bio note, which I will not read because you can read and access in the website um, his bio note together with an abstract of his paper. If I may, I'd like to introduce our speaker in a slightly different, if candid way. I met our speaker, Paulo Pinto, in 2019 before the pandemic when he came for an exploratory meeting about organizing this event. In the past year, together with Dean Jonathan Chua and historians Noel Rodriguez and Chas Navarro, I would meet Paolo regularly in a weekly meeting to conceptualize, analyze, and actualize this conference. At every meeting, Paolo would likely say one of two things or both. He would say one detail, and he would say, I have a doubt. And he will do this consistently and reliably week on week. We know that Paolo's field of research includes work on early modern Southeast Asia and the European presence in Asia. I can only imagine the amount of careful attention he must have put in his research. I can imagine him saying to himself and others while in an archive researching, I have a doubt, and he'll focus on a detail or on every detail. It is not just his scholarship, on Iberian presence in Asia that makes him our ideal keynote speaker. It's also his understanding of the conference series as a whole. Paolo looked at every panel, at every abstract, every image, in every poster. There is a keynote speaker, you see, for each of the four parts of the conference, but his is the conference keynote for all the four parts of the series. It is in this spirit that he framed his speech, connecting the dots. I am excited to hear him speak, but before I give the screen to him, I'd like to invite all our audiences here in Zoom, as well as those on social media, please, if you have a doubt, or if you hear or spot a detail, you may want to type in a question as you think about it in the chat box or the comment section on YouTube or on Facebook. And our community managers will collect the questions and will try as best as we can to ask them as much as we can accommodate during the open forum later. I am sure Paolo is looking forward to a robust conversation as only an online format like this can offer. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving the warmest welcome to our conference keynote speaker, Paulo Jorge de Sousa Pinto of CHAM, Centro de Humanidades, Universidad Nova de Lisboa. Paulo, you have the stage. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikki. <laughs> I hope you are listening. Are you, you have the sound, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you all for joining us today at this opening session. I would like also to thank to my fellow members of the organizing committee, Jonathan, Noel, Nikki, and Francis for giving me the honor to present this keynote to the conference. Now, let me see if I can. <clears throat> OK. We will dedicate one full month to the Asian Iberian encounters and legacies that took place in the period of 500 years that separate us from 1521. It was in that year that an expedition arrived at the Philippines after crossing the southern tip of the American continent and the Pacific Ocean for the first time. The captain of the Spanish Armada and mentor of the whole project, the Portuguese Ferdinand Magellan, died in a fight in Mactan on April 27, but the expedition carried on and completed the first circumnavigation of the globe more than a year later. 
This bold and risky voyage had a deep impact in world history, but my keynote is not about it. It is about what happened before, the long and sometimes conflicting and puzzling path that ultimately led to Magellan's successful journey. <clears throat> well, we all love tales. We all love heroes from novels and Hollywood movies who accomplish individual feats, heroic deeds, discoveries, and risky journeys on their own merit. Even the documentaries about history that we watch on television tend to focus their attention precisely because that is what interests the audience on the profile and actions of a single figure. In the case of the maritime explorations of the 15th and 16th centuries, the cases of Columbus and Magellan are the most obvious, precisely because they developed individual projects and personally led the expeditions for which they became known. But what lie beneath remains in the shadow, generally speaking. <clears throat> this idea merges with the common notions that still persist today, that people in medieval Europe believed the earth was flat and that Magellan made his voyage to prove it was round. Other common notions refer to fears of reaching the edge of the world, sea monsters, frightening legends and superstitions about distant lands, or the religious fanaticism imposed by the Catholic Church that allegedly refrained people from exploring and going beyond the known limits. A perfect scenario waiting for a daring and fearless hero who would discover and reveal the truth to an ignorant and superstitious Europe. Well, the historical truth was not quite so. Actually, it was far more complex and interesting. Magellan's voyage was the final dot of a picture made of contacts, exchanges, and accurate knowledge and information about Asia that emerged slowly over the centuries from a mist of wonders, myths, and fabulous tales. The cradle of what we call Western civilization was not exactly Europe. In fact, it developed around a sea lake, the Mediterranean, that allowed the intensification of exchanges and the development of cities and states. This space was limited by natural barriers in the West and in the South and by inhospitable conditions in the North. To the East, the obstacle was of another sort essentially political in nature. In a word, an antagonistic power, the Persian Empire. It was not by chance that Europe obtained the first credible information about what existed beyond Persia after the military campaigns of, of Alexander, who reached India in the late 4th century BC. Until then, information came mainly from Herodotus and the works of Ctesias of Cnidus, a Greek physician of the Persian emperor. It was the two treatises written by this author that gathered and disseminated a set of fabulous stories about India described as a land of wonders. All the images we usually associate with medieval mythologies about, about Asia, that is legendary creatures and monsters, dog-headed men, people with huge feet that served as umbrellas, griffins, unicorns, gigantic animals, have their origins in the works of Ctesias of Cyrus. In the aftermath of the military campaigns of Alexander, in 326 BC, different images arose. A Greek called Megasthenes, who served as ambassador to the court of Chandragupta, the most powerful king of the Mauryas dynasty in the Ganges region, 
produced the first descriptions of the societies and kingdoms of India, as well as their geography and institutions. However, this author mixed credible information with descriptions of monsters and fabulous creatures. This confusion between fact and fiction lasted over time through the Roman Empire and the Middle Ages and was not contested until the 16th century. The main cause of this longevity was due to the fact that all this confusing information was reproduced by the main Greek and Roman geographers and historians, whose authority was not easy to challenge. What were the main geographical conceptions of the ancient world? <clears throat> well, there were several dominant, sometimes contradictory notions and concepts that persisted in Europe until the 16th century. One of the most important was the actual notion that the earth was round. Eratosthenes, who lived in the third century BC, made the mathematical calculations of the dimensions of the earth with a minimal error. Geographers represented the globe generally in a circular form with the three continents and the Mediterranean in the center. Some represented the continent surrounded by a continuous flowing river called ocean, but there was no consensus on this question. For instance, Ptolemy, one of the most prestigious names of the antiquity, thought exactly the opposite. An old question divided the opinion of geographers. Was there more water or more land in the world? By other words, the ocean were lakes surrounded by land masses, or was it the opposite? Say, the continents were in fact islands surrounded by seawater. One of the most interesting uh, ideas assumed the existence of a torrid zone south of Europe between the tropics. Here, human life would be impossible due to the extreme heat. Some considered the possibility of other continents could exist south of this zone as well as in the other side of the earth. They were called antipodes and the known world, say Europe, Africa and Asia was therefore unable to contact them. We'll be back to these issues later. <clears throat> For several centuries, the Mediterranean was a Roman lake. The Roman authors, however, were practical and conservative in nature and did not introduce relevant innovations. However, the rule of Rome over Egypt and the Red Sea shores increased trade contacts with India, where silks, spices, and other exotic products destined for the Roman aristocracy came from. It was around this time, sorry, I can, ah, okay. It was around this time that a Greek named Hippolytus learned about the pendular winds, that is the monsoons, which made it possible to sail directly from Arabia to India and vice versa. A treatise written in the first century of our era called Periplus of the Eritrean Sea described the coastal regions of India and the intense commercial traffic that linked this country to the Red Sea and from there to Rome. It also contains references to the island of Ceylon and a mention of a distant land called Thin, which is probably the first direct reference to China. The decline and collapse of the Roman Empire and the political fragmentation and turmoil that followed with the emergence of intermediate powers and new empires created new difficulties of, for communication and circulation of knowledge and information between the Mediterranean world and Asia. When the capital of the Roman Empire moved to Constantinople and Egypt declined, 
Land routes through Syria and Armenia gain importance over the Red Sea connections. Like the Persian empires in the antiquity, the Byzantine empire became the true middle barrier between Europe and Asia. In the seventh century, a new and powerful Islamic threat emerged. The expansion of this new power across the Middle East and North Africa posed a threat to the Christian kingdoms of Europe and in practical terms, accelerated and consolidated the isolation from Asia. In medieval Europe, the old and confused tales about the distant and fabulous East populated by legendary beings became widespread as direct contacts and trade with the Indian Ocean faded away. The geographers of the Middle Ages repeated the notions of the classic authors, adding new items, references, and information collected from the Bible. The typical medieval cartography, as you can see, is simple and does not pretend to be accurate. It merely represents the world schematically with Jerusalem and the East on the top. The view of the traditional, here is another one, the view of the traditional historiography tends to consider the Mediterranean in the Middle Ages as a battlefield where a besieged Christian Europe and a threatening Islam clashed. In fact, and despite the religious antagonism and the intermittent state of war, contacts and trade between the two sides were frequent. The Christian kingdoms of Europe looked with equal suspicion on the Abbasid Caliphate, the Turkish Seljuk Empire, or even the Christian Byzantine Empire. The first movement of European expansion towards Asia arose precisely from a misunderstanding involving the latter two entities, the Turkish Seljuk Empire and the Christian Byzantine Empire. In 1095, the Byzantine emperor asked Catholic Europe for military aid to resist the onslaught of the Seljuk Turks. But the Pope Urban II turned this request into a call for a general mobilization for an armed pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Rumors and stories circulated in Europe about alleged atrocities and, and massacres committed by the Turks against Christians in the Middle East. It was just another episode of the ignorance and the stereotype ideas that Christian Europe had about Islam and the realities of Asia, seen as decadent, rich, and heretical world. Thousands of pilgrims and soldiers then headed east, motivated by greed and religious fervor, eventually conquering several territories in Palestine and taking Jerusalem in 1099. This became known as the First Crusade and was followed by identical initiatives over the following two centuries. In one of them, the Fourth Crusade, at the beginning of the 13th century, the city of Constantinople itself, capital of the Christian empire of Byzantium, was besieged and sacked by the Crusaders. From this movement of expansion did not result a better understanding of Asian realities. On the contrary, another legend emerged, the one about the existence of an allegedly powerful Christian kingdom located somewhere beyond the Muslim world which had inflicted a heavy defeat on the Turks and was ready to contact Europe to form an alliance against the common Muslim enemy. This so-called powerful king who became known under the name of Prester John was supposedly a descendant of the three Magi and ruled over a large, wealthy and powerful realm. This story was actually based on distorted and confused information about Christian Asian communities and some victories achieved by the Mongols against the Turks. We may then ask, 
was medieval Europe knowledge of Asia only mythical and fabulous? Was there no new information since the late antiquity? In fact, there was. In the early 13th century, the Mongol leader Genghis Khan united several nomad peoples in Central Asia under confederation and founded an empire which expanded both eastwards towards China and westward towards the Middle East, the Caucasus and Eastern Europe. News began to reach Europe about the ferocity of the Tartars, as they were called, and the destruction they were causing in the Muslim world. Several embassies were then sent to establish diplomatic contacts, such as that of Giovanni Pian di Carpine and William of Rubruck, who left testimony about the realities of Central Asia. It was, however, the, uh, the report, the account of the Venetian Marco Polo, who spent several years at the service of the Emperor of China, Kublai Khan, that was most widely disseminated in Europe. However, and despite the amount of information he provides, Marco Polo's account contains unreliable elements and fabulous information. I am aware that this is a neurocentric perspective. So you may ask, what was going on outside Europe? Was there no geographical knowledge and curiosity? No travel accounts, no cartography in circulation? <clears throat> in fact, and I will mention only a small part of the history, the Muslim world developed and perfect various sciences from mathematics to astronomy or medicine. Geography and cartography were also made remarkable progress as proven by the treaties of, on astronomy and geography called the book of curiosities of the sciences and marvels for the eyes produced in the 11th century Egypt or Muhammad Ali Idris's map in the 14th century the traveler Ibn Battuta made several journeys through North Africa, the Middle East, India, and Southeast Asia, among other regions, producing important travelogues. However, his works were not known in Europe until the 19th century. The same can be said of Raban Sauma, the Chinese Nestorian Christian diplomat and monk at the service of the Yuan dynasty, who visited Jerusalem and Europe in the late 13th century, and who also left an account of his travels. These two were only known in Europe by the end of the 19th century. Another important name to remember is Ibn Majid, the famous Arab navigator and, cart and cartographer of the 15th century, whose works allowed an important development of navigation in the Indian Ocean. None of these was known in Europe at that time. So let's go back to Europe. In the 15th century, the Portuguese started ex exploring the Atlantic Ocean and the shores of Africa. <clears throat> the motivations that led the Portuguese to this project that would lead them to India are many and complex, and I will not describe them here. I just say that it involved politics, the desire for profit, curiosity, and also the wish to know the limits of the Muslim world and to look for Christians, perhaps the mythical Prester John, beyond that horizon. The process was slow, tentative at first, and linked to the old medieval motivation to fight the Muslims in the territories that were Christians before the Arab invasions. It was after the failure of military expedition to Morocco that travel gained momentum and the exploration of the African shores became more intensive. In the, 15, in the late 15th century, sorry, the process was underway and was already irreversible. Under the King John II from 1481 
The voyages started to be organized and financed by the Crown of Portugal, according to a meticulous plan aimed at passing the southern tip of Africa and reaching India. And finally, when Vasco da Gama made the first direct travel between Europe in, and India in 1498, the main motivations for the whole enterprise were summarized in an explanation that the Portuguese gave after landing. We came in search of Christians and spice. The Portuguese exploration voyages required a systematic and innovative work of adaptation of navigation tools and practices, ships, guidance instruments on the high seas, knowledge of the winds and currents of the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, the knowledge that existed in Europe at that time was useless because it was suitable for navigation in the Mediterranean, but not in the Atlantic. In this way, it was the practice of navigation and not information from ancient geographers that allowed the exploration and recognition of the African coast step by step. In this way, the Portuguese created a new tradition of geographic knowledge, parallel to the one already existing in Europe and based on classical authors. And this was perhaps the most important dot that would allow Magellan to complete his journey successfully a few years later. Can we then can we say that the knowledge of ancient geographers was replaced by the information from the exploration voyages? Actually, we can't. The weight and authority of the classics remained untouched, and they were challenged and removed only gradually. The most interesting example of what I'm saying was Duarte Pacheco Pereira, the Portuguese navigator, military man, and geographer who wrote a detailed description of the African coast with information about products, populations, fauna, and flora of each region. The very title of his work, Gemaraldo de Situ Orbis, written between 1505 and 1508, is an adaptation of a treatise by the Roman geographer Pomponius Nella, which reveals the way Pereira tried to reconcile the new data obtained by the Portuguese travels with the traditions of antiquity. It is, in fact, what he does throughout the entire work. His criterion of truth is new, not what the ancients wrote, but experience, which is the mother of knowledge, removes all doubt and misapprehension." End of quote. In fact, and despite his recurrent quotations from Ptolemy, Strabo, Pomponius Mela, and others, he dares to contradict them because the experience proves so. The most flagrant case was the information about the torrid zone, which they said it was inevitable, but the experience had, sh had shown otherwise. In another page of the work, he discusses the issue that divided geographers that I mentioned above. Pereira denies the authors who claimed that there was more water than land and was actually convinced that the opposite was true, that the oceans are in reality lakes surrounded by continental masses. Let me remind here that this tradition was defended by Ptolemy, who considered that the African continent was united with Asia by the south, and that the Indian Ocean was in reality a lake. When the Portuguese crossed the Cape of Good Hope and arrived in India, they proved the opposite. But Pacheco Pereira, who was aware of the extent of the American continent, believes that the Atlantic is a lake. Obviously, he was not aware of the existence of the Pacific Ocean. We know today that the oceans occupy about 70% of the surface of the Earth, but this notion only prevailed after Magellan has crossed that wide ocean. Finally, Pacheco Pereira turns 
to the authors of antiquity when he cannot obtain a satisfactory explanation based on his experience. At a certain point, he says that there are populations and wild men on the African coast whom the Asians called satires. And curiously, he too made fabulous descriptions, such as describing snakes of unmeasurable length that dissolve in the water when they enter the sea. I would like to add a final remark <clears throat> about the relevance of other traditions in a Portuguese project of overseas expansion. As I've mentioned before, it was basically a practical one, supported by empirical information collected throughout a long process of experience that took several decades. Meanwhile, the invention of the mechanical movable type printing press allowed a wider dissemination and circulation of books across Europe. Several classical books were printed, as well as the work of Marco Polo and other travelers. Ironically, one of the most successful printed works, some sort of a bestseller at the time, was the report of John of Mandeville, a book full of tales about monstrous creatures and fabulous beings. Well, even at that time, people preferred tabloids rather than scientific publications. Well, however, and unlike Columbus, the Portuguese were not looking for Cathay or the Cipango described by Marco Polo, whose influence in Portuguese map is actually minimal. They were after the real India and Malacca, China and the Moluccas in the following stage. And all the experience they acquired in Asia, <clears throat> sorry, was based on the maritime commercial world they were introduced after 1498, not the inland continent of Central Asia visited by Marco Polo, Carpini and other medieval travelers. This is definitely the background of geographic knowledge and practical experience that explain Magellan's plan to prepare his voyage in 1519. So the final dot. Let's end with a few words about now the contribution of the expedition of Magellan Elcano in the process of globalization that defines the essence of the modern world. In fact, it revealed the existence of a wide ocean between America and Asia that changed in a considerable way the perception of the real dimension of the Earth. It consolidated the formation of both Iberian empires, say, the Portuguese centered in Asia and the Spanish in America throughout the 16th century. It allowed the extension of Spanish America to Asia that lasted until the end of the 19th century, as the Filipinos know. But most important, it created a common bond between the different cultures and civilizations of the world when it proved that it was possible to travel around the world by sea. <clears throat> this aspect was truly the seed that allowed the modern world to germinate and grow. The navigation in, in the Pacific and the connection between Manila and, uh, and Acapulco in Mexico was the link that was still missing to the formation of a real global world. From that moment onwards, missionaries, merchants, officers, and scholars were now able to circulate from the new to the old world and vice versa, spreading knowledge and practices and exchanging goods, plants, books, ideologies, and information. Bolivian silver from the Potosi fed the Chinese economy. The Japanese screens called Biombus Namban reached Europe by both the Indian and the Manila routes. And Asian textiles were consumed in Mexico. These are only a few examples of the acceleration of trade and economic and social life that definitely changed the course of human history. Finally, let me quote the Italian Francesco Carletti, who less than a century after the expedition of Magellan Elcano, 
described with the following words the possibility of sailing around the world. We have never heard of anyone sailing around the world in the ancient times as we do today, thanks to the value and the virtue of the two crowns of Castile and Portugal, who revealed the way to us. One, sailing east, allow us to reach China and Japan. Through the other, the West, we reach the Philippine Islands near Macau in China, where the Portuguese are distant about 1,000 miles. With these two ways, the two crowns have drawn a circle around the world, something to be praised and honored by the two nations whose language and navigation permit anyone to make such a magnificent journey and that in less than four years, anyone can, can go around the world by both the East Indies and the West Indies routes. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo. I've received several questions that I still have to probably group together. Um, I'm, I'm scrambling behind the scenes, but before we start with the q and I'd like to invite members of the audience. If you are interested in asking a question directly, please feel free to do so, just so we could capture a bit of the spirit of a usual conference, which really is you know, for contact and um, communication. Um, you can alert me either by um, raising your hand, you can click on a reaction and um, when I spot you with a hand raised, I will call you and um, you can also bump me with a message. But we have received some questions, some by private message, some through YouTube. Um, Paolo, before I start reading the questions, those images that you use for your presentation are really, really interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, like, for example, the one you chose for your poster? Um, can you tell us about that image? I'm so sorry, while, while, while I'm gathering the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, uh, let me, if you'd like, uh, I can say a few words about them. Well, th this is j just for, of course, for coloring the presentation. Uh, and and in, at a certain point, just to visualize what I, what the information I was saying. Let me see. Of course, there I had much, <laughs> much more maps and, the, and the information. Uh, I, let me share perhaps this again. Fortunately, I didn't close the PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, this one, this one, um, you were talking about, well, this, then I reproduced here, here again. Well, it's a map. Well, from the middle 13th century, it's of course I don't I don't recall now the name. It is called the Southern World Map. Well, all of uh, this is in Wikipedia Commons, so this is not actually a secret. It, uh, the, the interesting is the contrast between this and these. These are very schematic, you know. Just uh, don't care about the details of the shores and the continents. Just the world was made of just three parts. You know, there is a notion here, always turning around. Here's Asia, Europe, Africa, and that's it. Here are the three sons of Noah. You can see, well, this is very schematic. While this one has certain worries about, well, it, it, it's not the, the way we used to, to see it because the, the East is on top. Because Jerusalem and the figure of Christ was always uh, imponent and he imposed in the in the maps in the cartography i'm sharing this right yes we can see it. <laughs> and so it it's well it's quite wonderful and there are other few examples and of course this this all this it's a typical and one of the most be beautiful uh, maps uh, of the middle ages of course these for, for, well this was just i know something some are very interesting, like these, all the mythical creatures that we are used to see when we talk about the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages and all the myths. And so there's, there was, of course, there was a few details I would like to explain better, but well, in, perhaps in another, in another seminar. One of, is this one of the Presser John? It says here as emperor of Ethiopia. Well, actually Europe thought the Presser John was in the middle, in Central Asia. But when was revealed that 
the Mongols were not the press of John <laughs> because of those travelers. Then the myth shift, the myth uh, don't disappear, they shift, they, 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 they mutate like the, the, the pandemic virus, you know? And so uh, other news came and so uh, uh, the press of John was not in Asia, but was in Ethiopia. And so when the Portuguese made their, their travels, they are at a certain point convinced that Ethiopia was the press of John. Well, this is just a detail. If there is anyone in particular that, that you would like to, yeah, it's to, okay. to... Okay, I have gathered, uh, have combined thematically some of the questions. Okay, so I grouped together some discursive questions more about you know myth and thinking. But um, the first set of questions I'll ask you has to do more with navigation. And for example, what is the relation between Vasco da Gama and I'll pronounce it the American way, Albuquerque. <laughs> no, how do you? And from where? Uh, yeah, you pronounce it your way. Then from where and how did Vasco da Gama get the aid of Arab and Indian navigators? And what is the evidence that Magellan reached the Philippine Islands from Malacca? So. Um, I, 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 will, I don't know if they're related, give, but I group them together. Yeah, yeah. I will give brief, uh, short um, answers. First, the relation between Vasco da Gama and Albuquerque. I think it, it's the question. Yes. Well, I don't know. I don't know any relation, any direct relations between them. Uh, um, um, well, they were both nominated by the same king. Well, and they are both relevant. Uh, well heroic figures of our history, of course. But Vasco da Gama was nominated with some sort. Um, let me just say a, a difference. Albuquerque was a governor. He had the project. He, he was a man of trust of King Manuel. That's why he was so confident and so violent and so brutal and so impositive in his actions in the Indian Ocean. While Vasco da Gama, apparently he was not a man of confidence of, of the king. And apparently he was just, you know, um, he was not like uh, Columbus and Magellan who had their own project of making the, 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 this journey. He was just uh, nominated to the king to be a, a diplomat because all the work had been already done by previous sailors and navigators. And so it, it's the, uh, a, a contrast that I would like to, to remark. But I don't know any real uh, similarity or connection between the two. Okay, the second question is, sorry, sorry, Nikki. Let me just <laughs> scroll down. Um, the second question is from where and how did Vasco da Gama get the aid of Arab and Indian navigators? Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, this is, is very clear. For, the, for Vasco da Gama, it was very easy. Well. Uh, to reach the southern tip of Africa, because the Portuguese had already explored, uh, even when Bartolomeu Dias reached the, 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 the southern tip in 1488. Well, but Vasco da Gama, he didn't make that uh, journey until the, the southern tip of Africa, like Bartolomeu did. He went through the high seas because the Portuguese know the circulation of winds of the Atlantic. Then suddenly, when he passed the Cape of Good Hope, he became more cautious because now he was in a new land. And so he goes uh, exploring the shores from Mozambique, then Mombasa. And he was actually looking for a pilot because there was no need for the Portuguese to explore the, 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 the Indian Ocean like they did in the African because the Indian Ocean was traveled, it was navigated intensively by Arabs and Malays and, and, and Gujaratis. And so he tries to find a pilot. The things didn't work well in Mombasa, but in Malindi, the Sultan finally gave him a pilot. It was uh, a Gujarati pilot whose, no, whose name we don't know. For a long time, people thought it was Ibn Majid, but now it's proven it was not Ibn Majid. A Gujarati and a North Indian pilot who just took uh, the, the armada and just conduct them to, to, to the Kerala coast, like Indians and Gujaratis were, were making uh, centuries ago. Okay, the third one is about the Philippines. What is the evidence that Magellan reached the Philippine Islands from Malacca? Ah, oh God. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. He didn't reach the Philippine Islands from, from Malacca. Uh, uh, as we know, he was in the East before his uh, voyage. He was in India, he was in Malacca. He, he, get, he got uh, a man called Enrique. Well, he will we will talk about him next Saturday. Uh, um, um, and then um, the question is, we don't know if while in Malacca, if he went or not to the Moluccas, not the Philippines, before the voyage, of course. Some people say, yes, uh, I have my own doubts. I really doubt that Magellan went to, to the Moluccas. Uh, but then he returned to Malacca, then to India, then to Portugal, then to Spain, and then he made his travel uh, through the Pacific. He reached the Philippines and he died there. And so he didn't reach the Philippines uh, from Malacca, but from the other way around. Sorry, Paolo. Um, the questions that I fielded to you are from social media. At first, I was worried that our conference will be too Zoom-centric and that we will not be able to accommodate outsiders. But now I don't want to ignore the Zoom room. Let me start by acknowledging the presence of someone who's in this room. I'd like to acknowledge the president of Ateneo is here, Father Bobby. Um, Father Bobby Yap already sent us a recorded um, message earlier, which we watched, but he is here in, in the room and we appreciate his presence. Acknowledging you uh, Father Bobby, thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to ask if members of the audience here have questions. Actually, we do want to prioritize the uh, participants of the conference. We still want to try to capture scholars coming together as best as we can. Um, is there anybody in the, in the group who wants to ask a question? Just raise your hand, let me know, or give a response if you have a different view from any of those that have been asked. Um, okay, if, if there's none, I'm still yes. scrolling. Do you see? Yes. Yeah. Um, Dr. Garcia, please have the floor. Um, we'll unmute you. Uh, we're asking to unmute you, so you have to unmute. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for your very enlightening lecture, uh, Professor Pinto. Uh, I was struck by your conclusion. Uh, you seem to make the Spanish and Portuguese join hands in the middle, but uh, uh, but aren't they weren't they competing? If you look at the maps, uh, they were they were they were stealing maps from uh, you know the, the, because the voyages were based on maps and so uh, there was also a kind of competition between Spain and Portugal isn't that correct? Sure of course it's correct. I, did I say that the Portuguese and the Spanish were joining hands? Oh my <laughs> well, I, I got that I got the impression that uh, no no, 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 I just limited myself to talking about the Portuguese because talking, making a comparative with the Spanish would took me another half an hour. Of course, yeah. there was a competition. Yeah. Uh, of course, the Portuguese took the first steps and then the Spanish followed. And then we had all of those competition involving Columbus and then the Treaty of Tordesillas and so on. So, yeah. And then yeah. the, por the Portuguese trying to reach Asia and they reach Asia through the East and the um, Spanish uh, uh, exploring and then colonizing America, uh, the, the, co the American continent and so on and so. And then the competition involving uh, Magellan, of course. This, uh, that yeah. in, in but the, didn't uh, Magellan also experience difficulties precisely because he was Portuguese with, uh, with more Spaniards in his crew and uh, I mean, international crew because there were Flemish and French uh, in his in his yes, voyage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there was a competition, but yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, this is also very interesting because we te we sometimes tend to to make extreme images of all of this. You know, sometimes when we want to to focus on the rivalry between Portugal and Spain, we tend to to make it. Um, too violent, you know, and there is um, 
I, I, I recall seeing on the Portuguese press two years ago when we were celebrating uh, the, the beginning of, of the journey, well, some people saying, uh, making a, a even in the port in in a Spanish documentary on History Channel, I think, saying that well, the rivalry was like the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War period. And I said, and I thought, no, 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 it's not. It's, it has nothing to do with that, because the Portuguese and the Spanish were rivals. But the King of Portugal and Spain, they were related, and. The Portuguese king was married to uh, Spanish princess and vice versa. And so we have to be a little bit careful when we talk about the rivalry uh, because it was a diplomatic pressure and so, but I didn't want to, to, to touch that <laughs> point, but of course that's undeniable. Okay. And, 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 yeah. We have questions in the chat box. We're seeing a bit of activity. Um, is it okay if I call or just read? Um, Sir Gary has a question. Um, should I just read it, or Sir Gary? How should we read Pigafetta's account of Magellan's travel? How much of it is embellishment and historical? But we'll also read something from the Facebook, um, so from social media again, or oh, from YouTube, sorry. By the time of the age of exploration, how expensive was European print culture? I'm curious about the audience, audiences of European travel literature, such as that of Marco Polo. How did explorers influence each other? And what is the purpose of depicting the East as the marvelous or the monstrous? Um, sorry, Paolo, uh, I, I have to read another question. I know that's a lot already because you might be able to hit you know, with a single answer, some of the things that they're raising. Someone also raised from YouTube, Carl Castro, who teaches design, and he's book, a book designer. Can you comment on how the Mercator projection continues to give us an imagination of the world, which distorts the comparative scale of Europe with Asia? Is this one of the enduring myths? <laughs> so wow, this, I don't know this, if you can connect uh, the dots, um, yes, yes, but yes. the questions are coming. Well, okay, about uh, just uh, sorry, I will be brief, but but the about Pigafetta, I don't know uh, the comparative work, uh, the work of comparing all the sources of the Magellan Elcano expedition, comparing how accurate they are, all of them. This work has been done by, by experts that have studied this intensively and extensively. So I, I'm not exactly aware of these details. I think from, from what I know, from what I read, and the, the, the big effect account, it is reliable because he was there. Uh, he was a man with some um, uh, uh, fluidity. In, but well, we don't know the original source. Of course, all we know it, it's an abridged uh, version. So I. I but I don't, I wouldn't like, I don't feel comfortable uh, discussing these deep specific details on big effect of work, sorry. About the, the, the myths, uh, sorry, the question was about the, 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 print, the printing um, uh, books in Europe and how travelogues and how the wonders were, were, were uh, interested. Well, as I, as I commented, well, um, now uh, people prefer to read tabloids instead of, of scientific books. It was more or less the same at that time. Um, it is, uh, and ironically, in the 16th century, when the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, were new information about the rest of the world was reaching Europe now with the printing press, this was, this was a time when the book of John of Mandeville and Marco Polo were most was, were best sellers, full of tales and fabulous myths and creatures of the East. And so this could be a contradiction, but that's what happened. Um, no, let me also just also saying this, some of, of the information we now use as historians were not available at that time. I talked a little bit about what Duarte Pacheco Pereira and his relevance. But his work, which now we consider very important for the study of that period, was only published in the 19th century. And so it was not available at that time for people to read. One of the most important books of world history, sorry, let me be uh, saying this, the account of Tumé Pires, 
which give very reliable information on the Asian world was published only in the, in the 20th century, the Summa Oriental. And so sometimes we, some of, of the report and information was, was not available at that time and was not printed. Unfortunately, some of the bad sources were published and disseminated. Uh, well, it's more or less like nowadays, we are still humans. The, the, the second one, the Sorry. second one, it was yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I'll tell you the second one, but I just want to say that the question you just answered was from Joseph Hill from YouTube. And the third question, the one on uh, the second one, the second one, the second one, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I just had that. Yeah, Mercator projection continues to give us, wait, an imagination yeah, 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 of the yeah. world. Wait, he adds, yes. he adds another. Is there a Portuguese connection to this myth? <laughs> Well, I don't know. Well, projections are, of course, uh, distorted images. We you know we all know now in the internet how the real dimension of the continents have been um, distorted throughout the centuries, putting Europe in the middle, and so the northern uh, hemisphere uh, larger than it is in reality. And there are uh, very important and interesting books. Of course, it is a distortion. But I don't know if it's actually a myth. And I don't know if the Portuguese contributed or not, sorry. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good clue for, for future research, but, but um, I'm not. I'm we not have sure. to do a time check though. It's 5.17, 5.18 now. We have two minutes left, Paolo. Yeah. So um, I'll just read whatever questions are still in the chat box that I have not, unless there's someone in the audience um, who wants to rush and, make it their question to be the last question. Any two minutes. Hand? Uh, two minutes, yes, because 5.20 is when you finish your Q&A. <laughs> ah, sorry, yes, 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 sorry, sorry. Okay, yes. no, okay. Question from Messenger. Would you say stereotypes from early accounts have become deep-seated such that, that they persist and resurface today even if in updated ways? Do old myths still shape the way we view current realities? Um, I think tied to myths, um, uh, sorry, the yes. time, I should have read this first one first. What motivated Herodotus and others to imagine their land beyond Persia that way and not some other way. Okay, the first one, yes, definitely. The old myths are, as I, as, as, as I said a few minutes ago, myths do not really disappear. They mutate, they change, they shift their, their shape. And some of the old myths are actually very rooted in our view of history and, and the world and the other people and the other civilizations, definitely. Uh, we could discuss hours about uh, how these myths, some of them uh, origin very remotely, but other in the modern age, uh, in the 16th century, still remain and sometimes dominant and sometimes not uh, actually visible but more or less occult, definitely, yes, I agree. The second one, uh, about the, the second one, about Herodotus. Well, the, 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 the experts who studied this particular time frame and this question, uh, they asked themselves, but if Herodotus was so reliable um, um, uh, describing the wars in, in Greece, why was he so unreliable about all of this? Well, <clears throat> There are uh, lots of explanations. One of them is that uh, um, um, uh, unlike Tisias, that was an ambassador in Persia, Herodotus, uh, it's not sure that he, 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 he traveled. And so most of the information was second-handed. And so uh, this is always a problem of second-hand information. Uh, uh, sometimes people say, yes, it's true because someone told me. And then when he writes, it's not exactly what he has been told. Even Duarte Pacheco Pereira, the, the, the geographer, I, I told the Portuguese one, he said clearly, this is true because I saw it. He declares the man who has the criterion of the experience said there was huge snakes who dissolve in water because I saw it, you know? And so in remote times, and then when we know the first hand 
uh, sources but copies, some of this information deteriorated. And so we only know fragments of this. But this, it's, it's a very important and, and but complex question. Okay, Thank Paolo, you. in our committee, you're the one who sticks to the time. Are you yeah. willing to take one more question, even if it's beyond time? Beyond sure. Time? All right. Um, yeah. Joseph Hill had a question from YouTube that I asked earlier, but it came with a second part that I think is very interesting, so I'll read it anyway. The question is, what is the purpose of the first question he asked earlier is what is the purpose of de depicting the east as the marvelous or monstrous then this is the follow-up he quotes a filipino scholar historian resil mojares for instance he gives an example in an essay resil argued that pigafetta portrayed south america more exotic and marvelous while the philippines was more familiar wow yeah, wow. <laughs> wow, I don't, well, I'm not, that's interesting. Uh, anyone else in the room can comment if, if you. I, if you that's can interesting. Because, but as, as I told you, I'm not exactly an expert on the Pigafetta report and the, the, Pigafetta, uh, the Pigafetta, sorry, account. Uh, I know it has been studied extensively in all details, but, uh, uh, but that's interesting because I've never had the idea of comparing how he saw the South America. I know that Patagonia, the giants and so on, it looks more exotic, but I never had this, this comparative uh, view. Uh, perhaps if uh, anyone, any, yeah, anyone any, can help. Room, please, please help me. <laughs> <laughs> but no. if there are no raised hands, this is just an initial contact. Our conversation yeah. will continue for days and weeks for the entire month. Thank you very much, Paolo, for that speech and for the open forum. I'm afraid that's all the time we've had, we have today. Don't leave yet. I will give you a comprehensive conference overview of what's to come. And for the people in the Zoom room, after we've um, cut the live stream, I hope we can still take a group photo for posterity, just so we can show that we had a conference and it started. So let me start with um, the conference overview. Um, I would like to share with you that, um, of course, many of you have heard that it's a four-part conference, and every week on Wednesdays, we start a new part of, a conference, of the conference. Part one will be on legacies of encounter in seafaring and trade, and that will begin tomorrow with a keynote speech from our very own Father Rene Haviliana. I saw him in the participants, you know, he was in the Zoom room. Um, and there will be panels one and two as well tomorrow. So while the posters are different, you can come in and hit all three in one Zoom meeting. If you come in at four o'clock and stay until seven, you will see the keynote for the first hour and panel one on um, um, putting the Philippines on the map. That's the, what I call the Garcia panel because the two speakers, one from Europe and one from Asia, both are named Garcia. And the cartographic panel, panel number two, all three will be tomorrow. And I hope you can join us. On Friday, the Department of History will host panel three on trade routes. And on Saturday, we have a special panel. I'll talk, yeah. Um, this will be representations of Enrique de Malaca. And there will be four artists, two filmmakers, Pedro Palma from Portugal, Kidlat Tahimik from Baguio, Luis Francia from New York, and Ahmad Fuad Osman from um, Kuala Lumpur with his visual arts uh, exhibition, Luis Francia, his entire play. All the conference posters you can find in our Facebook page or on our website have the links to their works, which you can watch asynchronously in a virtual festival. And then you can come to the special panel to listen to them talk about working on Henry de, Enrique de Malaca. And then on Monday, um, the His Department of History, so we go back, sorry, to the previous slide. On Monday, um, the Department of History, still the previous, yeah, uh, the Department of History will host panel four, seafaring and shipbuilding. Building And finally, on Tuesday, the Environmental History Panel, Panel 5, will be hosted by the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability and Environmental Science Department. And that will be the end of Part 1. Wednesday next week, we start with Part 2. It will be a conference on the legacies of encounter in ideas and identity formation. 
The Ateneo Library of Women's Writings will host the keynote speech by Barbara Watson and Daya, followed immediately in that same Zoom meeting, uh, panel six on gender. The Department of History will host on the next day panel seven on difference and identity, followed by panel eight on the idea of Christianity to be hosted by the theology department. Panel nine on Filipino Hispanic identity will be hosted by the modern languages department. And there will be a special panel organized by the Kagawaran ng Filipino, that's the Filipino department, entitled Panitikan at Pananampalataya. Uh, the panel will be in the Filipino language, no? but it's about literature and religion, readings and performances. So those of you who are studying Philippine studies and you want to flex your language skills and check how much you know Filipino, you can join this panel. Um, part two, uh, part three of the conference will be on legacies of encounter in institutions. The philosophy department will host the keynote speech to be delivered by Vicente Rafael, while the history department will host panels 10 and 11 on the Middle Ages and government institutions. Panel 12 on religious institutions will be hosted by the theology department and panel 13 on the city will be hosted by the philosophy department. There's also a special panel for part three on the legacy of encounter in institutions that is a panel organized by the Philippine Embassy in Portugal entitled From Spices to Startups. It will take a look at economic diplomacy, Philippine startups in the Web Summit, and investments of the Philippines in Portugal and of Portugal in the Philippines. And finally, part four. This will be the longest of, of the conference parts. It will last for more than a week for 10 days. It will look at the legacy of encounters in the forms of expression. It is after all the School of Humanities strength and that's why this area has a lot more panels. The opening keynote will be delivered by Javier Huescas and uh, it will be hosted by the history department followed by panels on architecture and flows of art and artifacts hosted by the fine arts department. There is a panel on literature to be hosted by the Modern Languages Department and a panel on cultural flows and negotiations to be hosted by the Filipino Department. The IS Department will host a panel on fashion. It promises to be a fun one. And the final panel will be on language and identity to be hosted by the English Department. So you, you see there are many people within the host institution that came together uh, to contribute to this month-long conferences to, from different departments, all departments in the School of Humanities and beyond, especially the Department of History. Um, just as we started the conference with Paulo Quinto's opening conference um, keynote, we will end with a closing keynote by your very own Ambet Ocampo on July 23, exactly the same, no, we're June 23 today. So you remember the date, July 23, a month from today, we will close this conference. And with that announcement, I'd like to close today's opening ceremony and opening keynote. Thank you to all people who are joining us from YouTube and um, Facebook. We have enjoyed um, presenting this and we're happy that you participated very well in the open forum. I'd like